Well, good morning, Trinity Church. My name is Jenny Small. I'm a senior associate pastor here at Trinity. And it truly is an honor to be with you this weekend. Pastor Carl is out enjoying some time off with his family. He's actually on his way back now flying. I'm sure he's watching this online. So to Pastor Carl and all of those online, it's good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us. Uh, he will be back next week, as you saw, with a, a new series called Unstuck. It's going to be really awesome. I'm excited for. Uh, how many of you got to hear Dr. Cox last weekend? How many of you? Man, didn't he do a phenomenal job? He, uh, I constantly, almost every week, I tell Pastor Carl and Dr. Cox, when I grow up, I want to be like you two. Not like you two, the band, but like you, T-O-W, like you two. Uh, I just love them. They're, they're incredible. Dr. Cox is awesome, and his message about altar moments in our lives was really, really powerful. You can get that at trinitytoday.com if you missed it. How many of you would say that you are a vivid dreamer? Let me see your hand. Okay. You can raise your hand in church. It's okay. I know there's no music, but it's okay. Put them up, put them up. Vivid dreamers, let me see. Okay, so I am not normally a vivid dreamer. I just know the highlights. I always save the world, every dream. I just, that's how it always ends. I save the world. Um, but when I do have vivid dreams, like that, it's very rare. And so I try to pay attention if I remember. And so a couple weeks ago, my wife was sick. I was sick. My daughter was sick. We were all in separate rooms and I had this night where I would have a dream and I would wake up and I would remember everything, like every detail was so vivid. And then I would go to sleep and I would like, and I had the same dream twice in a row. And so when I woke up, I was like, maybe I should write that down. That, that seemed, I, I don't know if that was important or not. So I wrote it down and I'm thinking like, okay, maybe this has some importance to it. And, and let me tell you the dream. So uh, I'm, I like wake up in my dream and I'm on this construction site in like downtown, big city. And the ground has been cleared, and there's con hundreds of construction workers, and they're building a skyscraper, right? And so I, it's like a time lapse I'm watching, and so it's like, they're like moving, it's like those little ant videos, it's like, you know what I'm saying? You watch those videos. And the skyscraper goes up, and, and I'm watching, and what I thought was like really interesting was like, they weren't putting anything into the building, like they weren't building rooms or anything inside, it was just like, a shell of a building. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's interesting. And then it was like, boom. And then I was at like a different construction site. And I'm sitting there and the ground is like cleared off and there's hundreds of people and cars and buildings and there's plans and there's people running around all this. But right in the middle of this dirt is just this giant hole. And the whole dream like was watching this hole. It was the most boring dream I've ever had. It's like that one where you're falling and you're like, can I just please hit the bottom? I don't even care what happens at the bottom. I'm just tired of falling. And I woke up. And so the next morning I'm like, maybe I should pray about that. That was interesting. And so I was praying and I was asking the Lord like, hey God, what, like, what, what was that about? That was like, not to, not, not to like judge you or anything, but that dream was terrible. Like, and, and not audibly or out loud, but just in my heart, like I, I heard the Lord say a couple things. He said, Jonathan, um, so for those of you who are wondering what JD stands for, it's Jonathan, okay, so it's worth the price of admission right there for some of you. You're like, yeah, it's been three years, I was wondering. JD, JD, it can't be that short. He said, Jonathan, a lot of people can build impressive, big, empty lives. The problem is always the foundation. When you don't have the right foundation, in order to build, you must build hollow. You cannot fill the building with anything of value. You can't fill the building with anything impressive because the foundation won't support it. And when a storm comes, it will demolish every building with no foundation. When you have the right foundation, you can build impressive lives that last and that are full. Jonathan, too many people are impressed by hollow lives that won't last. And then he said this, which I, I thought was so interesting. It was... This, he said, prayer and fasting put down deep foundations and fill our lives with weight. With weight. I want to share a message with you this morning that I've entitled, A Call to the Wall. A Call to the Wall. And that morning as I was kind of like going, okay, Lord, like empty lives, foundation, that's important. And I'm asking, you know, wait, what does this mean? He took me to this passage of scripture in Isaiah chapter 62. So if you have your Bibles, you can flip over there or it will be on the screen here in a minute. But in Isaiah, I want to give you some, I want to set the stage for you. In Isaiah, the author of the book, Isaiah, for those of you who are wondering who wrote Isaiah, there's two things happening. Isaiah is recording actual things that are happening in the life of Israel. So he is 
documenting changes, things, captivity, Babylon. He's documenting a lot of things. There's a lot of history going on that he's recording. But there's this second thing that is happening in Isaiah. And Isaiah is recording what he hears the Lord telling him to tell the people of Israel. We call the, he was a prophet, we call these prophecies. And so Isaiah would record at different points in his book, I hear the Lord saying to the nation of Israel, boom, and he would start to record what he heard the Lord saying. And what's really interesting and really, really cool is we just celebrated Christmas, and Isaiah is one of those books that we go back to where Isaiah as a prophet predicted and prophesied that Jesus the Messiah would come one day. That he would be born of a virgin, that he would be the Messiah, that he would be the Prince of Peace and Wonderful Counselor, and that the government would be built on his shoulders, right? So he, he, he prophesied these things. So in Isaiah chapter 62, Isaiah is doing this second thing. He is speaking to the people of Israel and he's recording for us centuries and thousands of years later what God was saying. And he records in Isaiah chapter 62 verse 6, it says this. I, the Lord, this is the Lord speaking, it says, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. I want to talk about this verse for a few minutes because I, I believe that for us as individuals and for us corporately as a church, that this idea that, that, that Isaiah records right here in Isaiah 62 is going to be pivotal for you and I in this new year. And what's interesting in this moment is that Isaiah records the Lord talking about two very different things. The first is he talks about watchmen. Watchmen on a wall, right? And so we, th we don't have a lot of watchmen on the wall around here, so it's kind of a weird phrase. But in ancient times, all around the walls of a city, they would post watchmen. In fact, when Nehemiah returns from captivity in Babylon and he's rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple, he instructs the workers to build in front of their house, to work with one hand and to hold a spear or sword with the others, to be watchmen for the attack of the enemy. In Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel writes that the Lord told Ezekiel this. He said... Ezekiel, watchman, if a watchman sees impending doom, meaning if a watchman on a wall sees an attack coming to a city, and he doesn't warn the city, and somebody dies, that the blood of that person will be on the watchman's hand. That the watchman will be held responsible because he had a job and he didn't do it. And vice versa, he says, Ezekiel, though, if a watchman warns a city of impending doom and nobody reacts and people die, then I won't hold the watchman accountable. And so all throughout scripture what we see is we see God giving a weight to this role of a watchman. It's a weighty responsibility and job description. But something happens right here in Isaiah chapter 62 verses 6 and 7. God speaks about a position, a literal thing, a fighting warrior position, a watchman on the wall. And he inserts a phrase that causes you and I to kind of go, huh. And it's this. You who call on the Lord... Give yourself no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. So here Isaiah records the Lord saying like, I'm posting watchmen on your walls and these watchmen will be people of prayer. That night and day they will pray, that they will give the Lord no rest until he establishes Jerusalem or his kingdom on the earth. So Isaiah records God saying that, hey, I am going to raise up people from among you who will be people of prayer. That in your generation, Isaiah, I'm going to raise them up. But for us today in 2018 as we begin the new year, I believe that God is looking for a generation of people who will say, I'll be a watchman. Like I'll be somebody of weight. I will give my life to prayer. I want to be somebody who doesn't just pray but is a person of prayer. And I believe that God is looking for them. And, and, and I was like reading about watchmen and I'm like all into it this week while we're traveling. And so I was watching a movie. Um, and I had this thing happen to me. Have you ever just like woken up one day and said like, hey, have you ever had this happen? Hey, I'm going to go buy a new car today. I'm going to go buy a car that nobody has. So maybe you like go to the lot and you're like, I want to buy a Chevy Tahoe. Nobody in Lubbock has a Tahoe, right? So you like go to the lot and you're like, yeah, I want this Tahoe. I want a white Chevy Tahoe. Like nobody in Lubbock has a Chevy white Tahoe, right? And so you buy it. And what happens? You drive it off the lot and what do you, lot and what do you see? Tahoes everywhere, all right? There's white ones, black ones, red ones, pink ones, green ones, some with flames, yellow ones, some on spinners, some jacked up in the air, some slammed down low, some with missing windows, some with lights. Tahoes are everywhere, right? I hate when that happens. Anyway, it happened to me. I'm, I'm watching this movie and I'm watching. Now I'm going to tell you a movie, but it's not an endorsement. You should not watch it, okay? Uh, and the movie is Troy. So I'm watching the movie Troy. It's an old movie. 
and I'm watching it, and I, this thing happens. Every time there's a major battle in this movie, there's a camera shot of a watchman. Every time. Whether it's the Greeks or the Trojans, there's always a watchman and a shot of a watchman. And there's this like, man, this is such a cool scene where the Greeks have landed all their ships and they're coming. And now the people of Troy are like terrified. And there's this picture of four watchmen on the wall. And they get this giant log and they're like banging it on a bell. Bang. Bang. And what happens? Like the whole city responds, right? Like warriors and farmers start coming in from the fields and they start handing out spears and swords and shields and archers start taking them. Why? Because watchmen had a responsibility to prepare everyone for what was coming. And I believe with all of my heart that God is looking in 2018 for people that he can trust with what's coming. But they will be people of prayer. They will be people of prayer and their lives will be weighty. Jesus reinforces this idea in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. He says this, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. That's great marriage advice if you're wondering. Verse 6. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? Check this out. Who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, I love this, comma, and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This question, will he find faith on the earth, sometimes we get mixed up. But if you study the original language, this phrase right here doesn't mean will he just find faith. But it's will he find this type of persistent faith. So Jesus is asking this question of his disciples and he's saying, hey, when I come back again... Will I find people among you who will give themselves no rest day or night, but who will be people of prayer? Will I find that on the earth when I come back? And so I I believe that like what Jesus would ask us is, hey Trinity, when I come back, will I find among you men and women who have given themselves to prayer, who will give me no rest until I establish my kingdom on the earth? Will I find that kind of faith on the earth? And with all of my heart, I want our answer, I want my answer, if Jesus asked me that, to be like, yes. Like, yeah, you, you will find in me somebody who is a man of prayer. Somebody who has a weighty life. That when you walk into your place of employment or work, that there's a weight that comes into the room with you. That, that when you walk into a situation with your spouse or you sit down at a family gathering, that people feel a weight about you. That there's a presence of God about you. And I would submit to you that the only way that we add weight or build a foundation in our lives that will last is through prayer. Through prayer. And so this morning I want to talk through a couple of things about how you and I add weight to our lives when it comes to prayer. The first thing is this, we must be preoccupied with Jesus. We must be preoccupied with Jesus. One of my favorite passages of scripture is Exodus 33:11. Exodus 33, 11 says this, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. I love that. I just, I mean, there is a jealousy in me for Moses. Like, you got to have Starbucks with God? Like, come on. I want that in my life. Face to face. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. See, when I look at our lives, when I ask myself this question, when I look at me and my Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or what's going on or conversation I'm having, more and more I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that we want the promised land. We want the promises of God. But we don't want to be preoccupied with the presence of the promiser. We want the promised land, right? We, we want the good things that God has for us. But We don't want to be preoccupied with the presence of the promiser. 
I am like this guy who um, I love to, uh, they call me an achiever, okay? Not they, but you know those tests you take online that you get sucked into when you're on Facebook. And it's like, hey, 15 questions to tell you your future. 37 questions to tell you your personality. And you're like, I don't have anything else to do except work. You know, I'll take it. So every time I take one of those, what it tells me is like, JD, you are hardwired to be a workaholic and an overachiever. And I'm like, thank you. That sounds awesome. But I'm an achiever, meaning like I am a list guy, list, L-I-S-T, list guy, meaning I'm the guy that will do something and then write it on a list and a few minutes later go back and cross that thing that I've already done before I made the list off the list because I love crossing things off a list. Amen. You know what I'm saying? It is, it is like an addiction for me. Like they, 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 it is like, it fuels me. It, it is like warm things in my tummy. It is awesome. Okay. And so I, I am like a list guy. So I, I'm that guy. I got sticky notes all over my desk. They're crossed off. And I don't throw them away. Most people clean their desk. They throw away their sticky notes with crossed off things. Not me. That is a badge of achievement. They are stacked together in my drawer. So when I open it, it's like, you are awesome. You are crushing life. Yeah. 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 I love it. Right. So at the end of last year, I had this conversation with my wife. And I came home and she said, hey, how was your day? And I was like, it was crazy. She's like, what would you do today? And I'm like, I have no idea. That, 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 mo- that haunts me. Like that, that conversation, it literally woke me up at night. I'm like, what did I do today? Like I, uh, I am nothing. And so I got online and I ordered a journal. A 300 and like something page journal that had 12 YouTube tutorials that came with it to teach me how to use this journal. I'm that guy. I don't just want to like do things this year. I want to demolish and crush and just oh things this year, right? So I get it in the mail and I'm telling my wife, I'm sitting at the table, I got headphones on, I'm watching YouTube, and I'm like, yeah, you, yeah, I'm gonna crush that goal. That's how this works. All right, yeah. And I take them off and I'm like, babe, this is awesome. And she's like, I don't care. <laughs> watch another video. Oh, yeah, why didn't I think of that? And I'm like, babe, this is gonna be awesome. I didn't tell you, it's 300 pages for the first three months of the year, okay? It is intense. Not for the faint of heart. I'm pumped. I am jazzed. I am like, yeah, right? And here's what I learned. I, and it didn't take 12 videos to teach me this. It didn't take this journal. But in order to say yes to a few things, the truth is that we have to say no to a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. In order to say yes to a few things, we have to say no to a lot of things. And if we're going to be preoccupied with Jesus, it means that we have to say no to some things. Because here's the truth. You can't be preoccupied with Jesus and the Cowboys. At least pick a winning team, okay? I know, I I know. I had to get it in. Pastor Carl's a Cowboys fan. I'm a Broncos fan. This might be my last time preaching. I just had to get it in there, right? But in all seriousness, we laugh because, you know, we love the Cowboys. But the reality is, is in order to make time for Jesus, we have to take time away from other things that we're already doing. I'm not saying you have to give up sports. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that I, I really think that God is looking for people who are preoccupied with him. And my concern is that Will, will, when he looks at our lives, will, will there be enough evidence for him to say, man, they were consumed with me. They were so preoccupied with me. They, they wanted the promises, but man, they were preoccupied with me and my presence and my personality. That's what I really, really want God to be able to say of my life. Um, and here, here's what I know. You, you and I will never go to somebody that we don't like or love, right? So I have a two-year-old. She's a little bit over two years now. And... Uh, I'm a people person, but she is quickly teaching me that not everybody is a people person. I didn't know that. My two-year-old, every time, you know, it happened after last service, I'm holding her, we're out in Trinity Central saying hi to people, and I'm like, say hi, baby, and she's like, nah. Mm. I'm like, baby, say hi. Mm. Uh-uh. I'm like, give him a high five, you know him. Uh-uh. And then she does this thing where when I'm holding her, she like curls her head into my body. And buries her face. Because in her world, if she can't see you, you don't exist. And you will go away. 
but she's teaching me that like my, I, my, I can never make my daughter go to somebody that she doesn't like or love. Look, you will never run to the father if you don't like or love him. You won't. You will never run to the father if you don't like or love him. And here, here, here's my thought. No matter how young or old you are, if you don't like or love the father, you won't go to him. And, and the, the truth is that some of us, we, we have this moment with the Lord where in prayer maybe we're asking for something and he doesn't do it the way that we want or in the time that we do it, want it to happen. And so what happens is we build up this offense in our hearts towards the father. And so when, when I'm up here saying like, man, in, in our, every day we got to be going to the father, you're like, I don't really want to go to the father. But I'll run to all of these other things for a solution. I don't want to go to the source because the source and me, we're just not seeing eye to eye. And look, if you and I are going to be people preoccupied with Jesus, we got to deal with that. You got to deal with the things that are frustrating you about God. He is big enough to handle them. Like, go to Freedom on Wednesday nights and just sit on Wednesday night on your university campus and just talk about the Father. Like, you need to work that out because, look, if we're going to be a generation that changes the world, we got to be a generation in touch with the Father. And you'll never be in touch with the Father if you're not close enough to touch Him. The widow went to the judge to get justice because the judge could give her justice. She realized the solution I need, I have to go to the source for my solution. And so when he, she said, I have an injustice in my life, where do I get justice? I go to a judge who dispels justice. And so Jesus says that when she had an injustice, the first place she went was to the judge. And when the judge didn't give her justice, where did she go? The judge. And when the judge didn't give her justice, where did she go? The judge. And when the judge didn't give her justice, where did she go? To the judge. She was saying, like, you are the solution. You are the source of the solution that I need in my life. And here's the, here's the best part. In the Old Testament, God commands that the judges, this was an Israelite woman, which would have meant that the justice, the judge that she was seeking, would have been a part of the Levitical priesthood family that would have been over a tribe, that would have been in that position to dispel justice. And God's main focus was that these judges would dispel justice to widows and orphans. And so this, this widow is going to this judge and she's saying, you promised, God promised me that you would give me this. And so I'm coming to you because this is the solution. This is the source that I, this is where it comes from. So I'm coming to you. And, I, and, I, and unfortunately, when we look at our lives, the reality is, is we go everywhere else than the source for a solution. We'll, we'll pray and if it doesn't happen right away, we go somewhere else. I'll just figure it out on my own. God's not listening. God doesn't care. Well, God's not listening to, to my hurts and wounds, so I'm going to put them on Facebook. Well, I didn't get what I, I man, I, God didn't help me in this situation, so I'm just going to quit this job and go somewhere else. Maybe we just need to be people, and like Isaiah says, that will give him no rest day or night till he establishes his kingdom on the earth. Maybe we need to be like the widow, that persistent faith would be developed in us to be people of prayer, that we would go night and day to the solution, to the source of that solution, which is the Father. The second thing I think is that we have to build the right things. Build the right things. Jesus got on to a group of people in Matthew chapter 21 because they were building the wrong things. He says this, he says, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Interestingly enough, Jesus right here in Matthew 21 is actually quoting Isaiah 56. Now Isaiah 56 verse 7 says this, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so God is talking to Isaiah in Isaiah right here, and he's saying, you know what, my, my goodness, my grace, my mercy, my salvation, one day it's going to go to the Gentiles, those outside of the Israel nation. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to get it. They're going to realize that I'm God. They're going to realize that I'm their hope. They're going to realize who I am. And they're going to come and they're going to offer sacrifices and worship and praise. And you know what? I'm going to accept it because they're doing the right things. I think sometimes we get really caught up in the devil's lie to build the wrong things. 
We look around and, and the devil whispers in our ear like, you better have a good 401k. And so we spend years building that. Hey, you better have a good house because your neighbor's is better than yours. And so we build a good house. Hey, you better have a good vacation because on Facebook and Instagram, everybody's lying. But you should, you don't know that. You got to have a vacation better than theirs. And so you got to build that. And can I tell you something? At the end of the age, when Jesus comes back, none of those things will matter. He's going to come back and the things that will last will be the supernatural things that are built in the only place they can be built. And that is prayer. There's nothing in our lives on this side of eternity that will matter on the other side of eternity that's not built and rooted and established in prayer and the kingdom of God. So I, uh, I got this journal right and I'm writing out goals for this year. Whew, pumped. I'm not saying my goals are better than yours, but they're pretty awesome. And so I'm working on it, I'm sitting at the table and I write down this one and I tell my wife like, hey, I've got this goal for, for us as a family this year, okay. So my daughter's finally to the age where she can like start to understand stories and characters and stuff. And so I, I told my wife like, I want this year, I want somewhere in our bedtime routine to work in that as a family, in our pajamas, in the chaos of everything, unclean room, all of that stuff, that we would sit down and we'd read the Bible together. That, that simple, that we would just read through the Bible together as a family. And here's why. In 30 or 40 years, some guy is going to come along who wants to marry my daughter. And after he climbs Mount Kilimanjaro and kills a Maasai warrior and a lion, tiger, and bear, we'll start to negotiate. <laughs> but then they're going to have this conversation about like, hey, how do you want to raise our kids? And on that day, my daughter is going to say this. We are going to instill in our children a love for the Word of God. And he's going to go, why? And she's going to say, because from the time I was two, my dad and mom built and forced into me a love for the scripture. And all my life, until I was 18 and a somewhat quasi-adult, they, they made me because they're the parents and I'm the kid and I didn't have a choice. And even though I wanted to watch Daniel Tiger, they turned off the TV and they sat down and they made me read the Bible. Because it was his responsibility as the head of our house to make me build the right things. And so we're going to do it. And he's going to go, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, we are. Why? Because, because we have to build the right things. And it, and it falls on every generation to make sure we're building the right things. But I think for us as parents, like, we have to take a stock and go, like, I have a responsibility to build the right things and even help my kids build the right things. And they may not recognize it right now that it's important, but you see that it is vital. And so just make them do it. So, you know, I didn't like that. JD, all this talk about prayer, like I really think that God is sovereign and so my prayers really don't matter. I was talking to a pastor a while back and he said this thing and it was, man, it was powerful and I want to read it to you. He said, JD, God has sovereignly chosen him to limit himself to the prayers of his people. God has sovereignly chosen to limit himself to the prayers of his people. Nothing happens in the natural that is not first birthed in prayer. Because you cannot do spiritual work in the natural way. We have to build prayer into our lives. It's the right thing and we have to build it into our lives. In our mornings, in our evenings, in our lunchtime, in our meetings at work, in our family moments, in our text messages with our spouse and to our kids. We have got to build prayer into our life because it's the right thing. Because it adds weight to our lives. All right, J.D., I get it. So how do we do this prayer thing? What does it look like? Number one, start. I know, it's profound. Start. 99% of you in the room can carry on a conversation, which means that you're 99% of the way there. <laughs> prayer is about inviting the Father, the, the, the creator of the heavens, into the everyday moments of your life. And it's really, really simple. Like, what's going on in your life? Who, who, who is hurting in your life? Who needs healing in your life? Who's got a broken relationship that needs something to happen miraculous in your life? Just start, you know, talking to the Lord about those things. I'll give you an example of how simple it is. All right, so for me and my family a couple of weeks ago, actually a couple of months ago, my wife's like, hey, you're off. Let's go to Altitude Trampoline Park. I'm like, sweet. I don't know what that is. I walk in and I'm like, and I turned to her and I'm like, babe, why have you never brought me on a date here? This is perfect. We can play dodgeball and I can smoke you and it'll be totally acceptable. And you can hit me. We can get our frustrations and work on our marriage. You know what I'm saying? 
I'm like, this is awesome. Why have we never been here? It's got trampolines on the floor, on the walls. This is awesome. And so my daughter loves it, but if I'm honest, like I think I love it a little bit more than she does. And so we, we go, my, we were traveling this last week, and my daughter for like three or four days in a row, row was like, Daddy, trampoline park. Daddy, trampoline park. Daddy. And I'm, so I'm like, all right, cool, sweet. You are a persistent woman. You are getting this. So I'm like, let's go. So I tell my wife, we're going to the trampoline park. So we go. We're jumping. We're having fun. Now, uh, how many of you have ever seen American Ninja Warrior? Or for those of you who are a little older, uh, American Gladiator. Those of you who really love the 80s and 90s. Let me see your hands. Okay, great. All right, cool. Uh, so... Altitude said, hey, let's build a little miniature one of these for kids, right? I consider myself to be a grown kid, so fair game. So I'm there, and uh, my daughter's playing, and a bunch of kids leave, and so we're hanging out, and I'm like, man, I'm going to go try this obstacle course, right? So I do the obstacle course, and I'm like, I feel pretty good. It's pretty, all right, I got it. Now, this thing in American Ninja Warrior that always happens at the end, it's called the vert wall, okay? Now, it, it is like a half pipe. You know, for like snowboarding or skateboarding, you know, those heathen sports, you know. Um, in other words, it's a pipe cutting half, half pipe, okay. So, but it's really only one end of it. So there's a curved wall that you run up and then you jump and you grab the ledge at the top and you pull yourself up, okay. So I'm there and I'm thinking, yeah, I can do this. This is like 12, 15 feet tall and I'm like, I got this, right. So. Look, no matter how old we get, ladies, fellas, we want to impress our significant other. So I'm thinking, I'm about to show her that she is lucky. And so I take off running, like Usain Bolt. And I jump, and I grab it, I pull myself up, and I'm like, yeah! And I look out, nobody's watching. Nobody. My wife's talking to her mother-in-law, looking in the other side of the room. Nobody's there. And I'm just like, Really? Just crush this thing. Cross that off the list. <laughs> so I slide down, and a little while later, you know, I'm hanging out, and there's this, there's this kid sitting here, and, and so I'm forever like a youth pastor, so I'm like, hey, what's your name? What school do you go to? You know, whatever. And I'm like, how old are you? He's like, I'm 14. And we're sitting there, and I'm like, yo, have you ever done the vert wall? And he's like, yeah. Now, they have three sizes. Like, uh, yeah, you got this. That's cool. A medium, like, all right. And then a wall of death, Okay. And so I'm sitting there and this 14-year-old, and I'm like, hey, have you ever done this? And he's like, well, I've done the medium one, but I've never done the tall one. I'm like, really? You've never, okay. I know what you're thinking. Yes, I do enjoy crushing 14-year-olds, okay? <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. So I'm waiting, and my wife's like, you, you, you did pretty good on that other one, I think. I'm like, you weren't even watching. She's like, you can do it. It's not that much taller. In reality, it's like three feet. I'm like, yeah, I got it. So I take off. It was a long way. And I run and I jump. And then slow motion starts. Now, anytime somebody tells a story and they tell you, and then in slow motion, it's never going to end well. Because all good things happen quickly. All bad things happen slowly. All right? And so I'm there and I'm like, ah, and I realize like here's the top of my hands and there's the top of the wall and I got no more oomph to go. And so then I, I'm like, ah, no. So then I start falling in slow motion and I'm like, ah. And I'm thinking, this is a lot further down than I thought. Now here's what I didn't take into consideration, okay. On a vert wall, on a normal medium-sized one, it curves up and it's like straight, right? So you just grab the top. On a taller one, they curve a little out. So it kind of hangs out a little bit. Meaning when you fall, there's nothing under you. I didn't take this into consideration. I'm just thinking all of these are the same. This is my second one, of course. I'm falling and all dainty 195 pounds of me lands on my heel. Now if you were wondering if your heel is important in your life, it is, okay? It's actually much more important than any of us really care to mention, right? So I land, and I'm like, oh, oh, that breathless, oh, tense stomach, I might vomit, I don't know, kind of feeling. And my wife's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, why? And she's like, because the whole gym just heard your thud on the floor. I'm like, yeah, I'm cool, I'm just going to walk it off, you know. 
And let me tell you how simple prayer is. I walk around the corner and I was like, oh, sweet Jesus, come back. Lord, come back right now. Like, I need a miracle. Lord, heal this now, God. Ah. And in my mind, but not out loud, I am cussing this 14-year-old. I'm like, I pray you have braces. I pray that they got to put the whole thing around your face. How dare you trick me into doing this? This is ungodly. Ah. Terrible. Prayer is really simple. And if you're thinking, man, you're moving around pretty good today. I am on a lot of Tylenol and a lot of ice in between services. And for the last three days, I've been like in a comatose of ice bucket bath. So prayer is really simple. Jesus, get involved in the day-to-day moments that I'm facing. That's it. The second thing that I think we've really got to be good at is praying the promises of God. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The author of Proverbs is saying that when you and I speak, we're creating something and we will reap what we sow. And so we cannot undo what we build in prayer by the words that we speak. Did you catch that? We cannot undo what we've built in prayer by the words that we speak. So how do we build things in our lives that will last? We, we pray scripture. We pray the promises of God. What does this look like? It sounds really hard, but it's really simple. We've got a a slide we're going to throw up with some scripture on it. And I just want to show you how easy this is. Isaiah 40 verse 29. Okay, I just, I literally Googled promises in scripture. Promises of God in scripture, okay. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Here's how this looks. Me and God, I, it takes a lot being a, a single parent. It is overwhelming being a stay-at-home mom. Like, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I'm exhausted. I haven't had a a full night's sleep in months. And I don't know if I'm going to make it. God, I I don't know what to do. But your word says that you give strength to the weak. Your word promises that you will help those who are weary. You give strength to the weary. And so, God, would you just give me strength right now? And you just make that your prayer. Isaiah 40, 29, hey, what have you been praying about lately? Isaiah 40, 29, that he would just give strength to the weak, that he would give power to the weary. That's what I'm praying right now. And we just begin to pray the promises of God into our lives. The last way is one that Pastor Carl taught me a few years ago when I came to staff, and and it's one that I just absolutely love, and it's called breath prayers. Breath prayers. Breath prayers are brief expressions from our heart that can be spoken to God in a single breath and repeated numerous times throughout the day. So we do this thing every year in January called 21 Days of Prayer where as a family and a, of believers in a church, we just commit to pray. And this year as we were talking as a staff, one of the things that we just felt like God was laying on our heart was to take breath prayers and to just pray them corporately. And so they're going to throw up a list of breath prayers that we're going to be praying as a church over the next 21 days. It starts tomorrow. You'll get an email about this. It'll be on all of our social media. You're going to get this list, okay. Uh, On your way out, we have these really cool wristbands. If I can pull it out here. It says pray strong. And so everybody say one. Okay, you can have one on your way out, okay. (laughs) Some of y'all are like, oh no, I'm taking six. You're taking one, okay. One. And breath prayers are as simple as, hey, you're working on your computer, or you're doing something, you look down, you see that bracelet, and you go, oh, what's today, Monday? I surrender. I just surrender this work to you, God. You're driving your kids to school. Ah, oh, God, I just surrender these children to you right now. <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel. No, you know. God, I just surrender my work life to you this year that I just surrender. We're going to pray that all day Monday. And then Tuesday, we're going to pray, God, would you fill me with your spirit? God, as I go into this meeting, would you fill me with your spirit? God, as I have this conversation with my boss, would you fill me with your spirit? God, as I respond to my wife's text or my husband's text, would you fill me with your spirit? And we're going to pray these seven prayers three days, okay? So in total, for over the next three weeks, okay? And our, and our prayer is that, sure, that you pray these with us, but our prayer is that it spurs you on to pray, maybe the prayer that God is asking you to pray specifically in your life right now. Maybe it's God, give me grace. God, would you give me wisdom? God, would you give me hope? Would you give me health or 
God, would you give me a dream? Would you give me purpose? Maybe that's the prayer you need to be praying. Our prayer as we go through these 21 days is that we would begin to build the right things into our lives. Prayer, we would build it in. And through breath prayers would be one of the ways that we take prayer and we put it in our lives and we begin to add weight to who we are. I've posted watchmen on your walls, Lubbock. They will never be silent day or night. You, Trinity, you who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. And give me no rest till I establish my kingdom in your city, in your marriages, in your families. And I make my kingdom the praise of the earth. See, our prayer for us as a church this year is that we would be people of prayer. Not people who occasionally pray, but that in our core and in who we are, that we would be people of prayer. That we would be weighty people. Not Christmas weight, but weighty. Deep, spiritually rooted people. Because here's the reality. You, you belong here. You belong to, to this family, this tribe, this movement, this messy table, this church. Whatever you want to call it, you belong here. And we need you. We need you in 2018 to show up every weekend and worship and pray with us. We need you to show up in life groups. We need you to give of your time, your talent, your treasure. We need you. We need your prayers. Because our destiny is tied to your destiny. And we need your prayers. And maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus. And you've never given or surrendered your life to him. You've never made that declaration. You've never believed in your heart or confessed with your mouth. Here in just a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer give you the opportunity to surrender your life to the Lord. You can, you're going to pray it out loud with the rest of us. And let me tell you this. Following Jesus will cost you everything. It will cost you everything. But there is nothing this side of eternity, there is nothing outside of Jesus that will fulfill and satisfy and give your life meaning. You will not find it. It can only be found in Jesus, but it will cost you. So every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you today and you want to surrender your life to Jesus, pray this prayer out loud with the rest of us. Jesus, today I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I confess that you are Lord. And today I surrender. I surrender all of my life to you. I accept your grace and your forgiveness. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me a son, make me a daughter. Give me the strength and the grace to walk this out from this day forward. Jesus, I pray over every heart and story in this room this morning. God, I pray that in the coming days, weeks, and months, God, that you would make us people of prayer. God, that we would respond, that we would be watchmen on the walls of our generation and in our city and in our families. God, I pray that you would make us weighty people. God, that we would be carriers of your presence. God, that everywhere we go, we would carry you. We'd be preoccupied with you, Jesus. God, I pray that this would be a year where prayer just finds its way into every moment of our lives. And I pray that in 2018, God, that you would do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. That you would blow us away with your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. It's in your precious and holy son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, don't move. Just, I got a couple announcements for us as a church family. If you prayed that prayer for the first time to surrender your life to Jesus, we want to be a part of this journey, okay? When I said you belong here, I didn't, that's not lip service, okay? So there's a connection card between the seats. You can grab that. Fill that out. You can drop it in an offering box on your way out. You can take it to Guest Connections. You can do it online or in the Trinity app and let us know. But we have resources we want to put in your hands. Specifically, we've got a book called Next Steps filled with scripture and ways that you can walk this out in your life, okay? And here's the reality. Every single week, Pastor Carl gets up here and he talks about our next steps. And the truth is that every single one of us, no matter how long we've been following Jesus or how long we've been a part of Trinity, we all have a next step. And maybe for you, it's to go through Fast Track, our, our membership class, to learn about who we are as Trinity and to begin the process of getting involved. Maybe it's to start serving or to find a life group that you can plug into and be a part of. But here, let me tell you immediately your next two steps for every single one of us in this room. The first one is that you're going to walk out these doors and you're going to get a wristband, okay? How many are we getting? Good. All right. You guys are way smarter than the 10 o'clock service, okay? 
You're going to get one wristband. And here's the second thing that you're going to do. On Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we're going to gather in this room as a family and we are going to worship and pray. In fact, this year as a part of our 21 days of prayer, we're going to have three nights of worship and prayer together, okay? All on Wednesday nights, the next three Wednesdays. I'm really excited because the first two, the, the 10th and the 17th, we're going to gather just as our church family, okay, as Trinity Church, okay? We're all going to be here, youth, kids, family, it's just going to be beautiful, okay? And then on the 24th, we're inviting all of the churches of Lubbock to join us for that night of worship and prayer as we pray for Pray Jones. It's happening March 25th uh, at Jones AT&T Stadium where we're going to gather with Christians from all over our city and surrounding counties to pray that God would send revival to our city and our nation. And so I'm really, really excited. So why don't you stand up with me? Pastor Carl is going to be back next week. He's starting a new series called Unstuck, Getting Unstuck in a Sticky World. And I'm excited. He's excited for his message. You're not going to want to miss it. So we love you guys. Be blessed. We will see you next week.